there we go. Um, and uh, so official, official welcome to everybody. I'm just going to change my view myself here. Uh, I'd like to ask everybody if you could just put uh, your computers on mute for now while Larry is going to do his presentation. And uh, there'll be time to ask oh, questions. Oh, maybe, maybe we'll take a little break in the middle as we go along. Uh, and also, if you have any questions, you can, oh, Nicole is screen sharing. Nicole, you have to stop screen sharing. I don't know how that happened. There we go. Okay. Um, we've got people joining us still, as you can see. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've already said it's great to see you. I've already said what the MCQ Gardening Collective is. Uh, I'm Julie Miller. I work for CASE. CASE is the Center for Access to Services in English, and we support the vitality of the English community in the Mauricie and the Centre Québec. We have lots of different projects and programs. You can check us out. And everybody who's just joining in right now, please keep your, uh, yourself on mute for now. We'll open it up to questions a bit later. So now just, uh, I don't know that Larry needs any introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. This is the second time that he's been with us. He had, we had a really great meeting with him in the spring when he talked about building soil, uh, the, making good quality soil and making new beds. And I know he inspired an awful lot of us. Uh, I know that I've changed uh, the way I've developed some new gardening beds thanks to Larry. I think, uh, I don't know how many books Larry has published, but I think it's 50 or more. Am I, it's, more. it's more than 50. I, I don't know I, if you I found that you had forgotten about. I'm over 60 finally. It turns out. <laughs> wow. Okay. So you don't need any introduction, uh, Larry. You're far from lazy. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, th thank you so much to, uh, to have accepted our invitation. And uh, I'll just I'll just pass it over to you right now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here talking to you, waiting for the storm to come through. You'll get it before I will. I'm for the recent Quebec City, but I'll have it too. <laughs> so we'll finally have a winter maybe yet. So we're all, we're all looking forward to that. I think all gardeners enjoy, enjoy winter. And it's our seed ordering season right now. And I got my orders in um, just at the end of the year. I didn't want to wait until January in case it ran out again, like last year. And so seeds are starting to come in and I uh, hope you'll get some soon. And if not, garden centers have them. I think they're allowed to sell seeds and plants right now. So you can always go and get them if you want them there. So we're gonna talk about growing seeds. And basically I'm talking about growing seeds indoors, starting up to get the garden going. Outdoors, that's a, a bit later on in the season. So what I'm gonna do is kind of pull up in a second, a, a video, a PowerPoint, I should say. And why is it not pulling up? It should. I think it was not touching it. There it goes. And I was on screen share. Where did that go to? So have you, are you seeing my full screen right now? Yes, we are, Larry. Yep, okay, it's great, looks great. Okay, perfect. I, I, I'm at the end, how did that happen? I thought I was supposed to be at the beginning. Darn, so I'll move it back up. I do all of my finger, I'm not that fast, we'll see. Larry, would you mind if I sort of interrupt about maybe yeah. halfway through, ask if there's any questions at that point or? Yeah, or yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so growing from seed, it's a, it's a wonderful occupation. It keeps you busy. It's interesting, it's exciting. I must admit when I'm growing that plants from seed, I'm up at least twice a day checking them out. You don't need to check them twice a day, but it's just so much fun watching them grow. And they change and they change and they grow and they grow. It's amazing you can do that in such a short time. So start off with germination. I'm basically gonna go from the beginning. For those who never tried it, who don't know what it's about, work, work through the different things we can do. And you'll see it's not, it's easy in a sense. It becomes complicated because you're dealing with a lot of different plants and each one has its preferences. So the complications come more from that. 
They're not complicated things to do. You just have to, have to keep track of what you're doing with your plants. So it starts with germination. That's when a little tiny seed, which looks nothing like a plant, suddenly starts to open up and sprout and grow leaves. The first two leaves are called cotyledons. There could be two or one, it depends, most have two. And then new leaves grow in from the middle, starting to look like the real plant, and it starts to grow. And this can happen in just a few days. It's just amazing from almost nothing to everything, nearly overnight. It's just one of the most exciting things I find anyway. Now, I like to, to talk about when to start seeds, starting them indoors, because if you start them too early, they go too tall and too fast. <laughs> of course, that's what I'm showing in the picture here. A sort of very stringy tomato plant, which, which started far too early. And I'll tell you something, I get a lot of emails. Not yet, but in February, I'll start getting emails from people saying, what do I do? My cucumbers are already at the roof. What do I do? My tomato plants are flopping over. <laughs> it's just far too early for these things. So you have to start them at the right time. Tall, wimpy plants, plants that have weakened from being grown too long indoors, don't give good results. They are the worst. Now, if you start them too late, that delays your harvest. That's not the end of the world. You know, okay, you eat a few days later. And if you, if you had a choice, it's much better to be a bit late than to be, yeah, than to be early. Early is not good. Late is not so bad. And then of course, if you do it just right on time, what I try to get, and I'm, I'm, you should try for the, for the same thing, is to have young plants that are vigorous and strong, that are just ready to jump into growth. You do not want them blooming indoors. You want them to be strong and ready to grow. And that's really the goal. So they don't have to be huge. They just have to be healthy, full of energy. And when you put them outdoors, where they get more light, they should shoot right up and off you go. And you've got a good gardening season much away. Now, when to start seeds? You have to know when, and that's that's one of the complicated things because wouldn't it be so much easier if I could say that every seed in the world has to be started three weeks before you plant it out? That would be so easy. It doesn't work that way. You've got plants that need a lot of time to get started, and then your other plants you can sow directly outdoors. So you've got to learn where to go to get the information. And seed packs can be wonderful things. They have different kinds of information on them, but most of them will say somewhere when to start the seeds. And you can look there. These are people who grow these are experts. They probably got the timing down just right. And in this particular case, it's a zinnia. I just chose this pack just like that. It could have been anything. And you can see that it says start indoors three to four weeks before last frost. So that's easy to calculate. It could have been 12 weeks before last frost. It could have been start directly out. It has direct so is it an alternate choice after danger of frost. But you do have this information, and that's the place, first place I would look. Now, if you don't have a seed packet, um, it could be some seed companies don't have the information on the back, and, or you could have collected seed, harvested your own. Uh, well, then look on the internet. You can usually find the information there, or you can check it out in a book. But it's good to know when you should. And what I do is, I should have brought an envelope with me. What I do myself is I have these big brown envelopes. And when I see it's coming, because I order by mail and seeds arrive by miracle <laughs> all the time this time of year, I start putting them in, in, into the envelopes. One is marked early May, that was marked mid May, another one is marked end of April, you know, and I just put them in the right packages so that when I'm ready to, to go, I know what to sell and when. Otherwise, I get confused. But it's important to look for that kind sort of information and those are places you can go. Now, what do you need? Well, the, really the red are the things you about have to buy. You have to buy seed packs, unless you're collecting seeds, and you have to get potting mix, that's for sure. Most of the other stuff here in the, in the middle section, you could find it, you can find it all at home. You've got it somewhere. We'll talk about that, but you can find these things. And at the very end, there's some three suggestions of things you might need, especially as you get more into it, more serious about it, and we'll talk about those too. But we're looking at the first, the, the ones in the middle, who doesn't have a tray they could use or a, a bucket or food tools, all the tools, all the tools I use in growing seeds come from the kitchen. They're all there. So I'd have to look very far. 
Of course, then I get in trouble because I forget to bring them back. That's another story entirely, but uh, you can find them quite readily. No, so what you need, you need pots. I'm just calling them impermeable pots, little pots. So I couldn't think of any good word for them because they're not necessarily in plastic. But we're, looking, we're talking about pots that we can grow our seeds in. And the ones, for, uh, the first group are the ones that are not going to let water throw, flow through the sides. They're, they're in plastic, they could be in other products as well. Uh, they could be pots that you buy or pots that you recycled. They could just be recycled containers of just about anything that you can use. It has to be big enough for your needs though. Don't get too small and don't necessarily believe everything you read on Facebook <laughs> because I, I keep finding them making kind of ridiculous suggestions of things you can sow seeds in. One is little egg cells. They're just too small. They start off very well and then you lose your plants because they can't grow. So, you know, you're a little bit bigger than that. But you can recycle margarine containers or bottoms of, of, of uh, milk containers. And then of course, little different seed trays. Um, I rarely buy them, I just recycle them. I end up buying plants and then wash them up and reuse them. They go on for years. And when you're finished with them, you can put them in the recycling. So you're there, I find them very handy. I have stacks of these things <laughs> and I need them, I use a lot. And so most of the, and the thing, nice thing about these, these more permanent pots is that you can use them again and again, just have to clean them well. And, and the, uh, the final point is, is the most ridiculous one. Remove pot before planting. Well, <laughs> yeah, but you never know what people are going to do. <laughs> they might've misunderstood that. And besides the ones I'm gonna show next, you don't remove. So it, it makes a contrast because you might need permeable pots, ones that can let roots grow through the sides. Uh, we, I, I sort of call them peat pots usually, although they not, they're not always made of peat. They can be made of coir. They can be made of cattle dung, as a matter of fact, is a possibility. But the idea with these particular pots is that when you grow things in them and you put them in the ground, the roots will grow through into the ground around. So they hold the plant when it's young indoors and later they, they let the roots go through. So it's a different way of using them. Now the peat pots are the hollow ones. Notice they all have drainage holes. I always need a drainage hole on a pot. I didn't mention that I should have. You need drainage holes in all any pot. If you don't have one, put one in there. There are also peat pellets, which are kind of fun. When I was a kid, it was the first thing I used for seeds. And I liked it because you put water up and they, and they expanded, which is really cool. But I must admit, I don't think they're that good. They tend to be too dense and too moist. And you now I, I carry them around to, to show at lectures and things like that. But actually I, I go more to the peat pot, pots if I have to. And I use a lot of paper pots, um, newspaper. I still get a, a newspaper only once a week now, but uh, I, I make paper pots. I don't know if you know this little tool called a pot maker, but you can just sit at your, at your dining room table and put up maybe 60 pots in, in 10 minutes. It's so fast and they're really nice and they hold together very, very well. And so uh, I, have, I make a lot of paper pots. When my kids were in, that was their job always. They had to do the paper pots. It was one of the little tasks they do around the house. Um, so these pots, the idea with these is that these are for seedlings that don't like the roots disturbed. That's a strange thing to say because you'd think what plant would like its roots disturbed? I, I can't imagine. But a lot of it, a lot of plants, most of them tolerate it very well. But then you have the ones that just don't. The cucumbers don't like the roots being bothered for one. Melons aren't happy with it either. And if you go into some of the flowers, just, some will just stand still and never move again if you bother their roots. So with these pots, you grow them in them from the beginning. You never ever transplant them out of the pot. You leave them in there. And when you plant them, you simply bury them in the ground, pot and all. Now the downside to this, of course, is that they're single use. These ones you cannot recycle. So if you pay for peat pots, or you use them once. Peat pellets, you use them once. Well, paper pots, well, we're already recycling, so that doesn't quite count but you can't reuse them, so that's the downside. So you're paying for something there. Now you need something to put these pots in. It has to be a tray of some sort, and it can be almost anything. 
The idea is to keep the water in the pots and off the floor on the furniture. And I've, I've already used, I'm sure you may have as well, uh, trays that did leak, and that's not a good thing. You try to avoid that, not a good step. So there should be no drainage for these. And I do have commercial trays, in fact, I have a lot of them because I use commercial trays for all sorts of things. But for seedlings, in actual fact, I tend to use the recycled ones that I pick up at the grocery store. And um, my wife knows this and she drives up her wall, but I will actually go out and buy things because I like the container they're in, which is kind of a backwards way of doing things, but it's like, oh, that's just the right size. And it wasn't maybe what I, exactly what I wanted, but it's close enough. And I just use it, just, they're just perfect. For them. It's like they were designed for gardeners. They're just amazing. I love those things. I have stacks of those as well. I store them up. If they only made them in one or two standard sizes, it's so much better to store, but they don't. <laughs> Unlimited numbers of sizes. Uh, you do need something to cover your seeds with at a certain point. We'll talk about uh, when exactly, a dome of some sort, or in the old days, would have said we put them under glass. Not many people use glass anymore. It's heavy, it's breakable, and it can cut, but you could. But we're using plastic most of the time these days. So something that covers and gets, the idea is to once a seed is inside a container covered with plastic, humidity builds up. You can see the image down below the, the one is a recycled dome for the tray. You can see somebody's chicken dinner there from, from the fruit supermarket being used. But it, it builds up humidity. And for a certain point, high humidity is very good for germination. So they have to be able to let light in because quite a few of these plants will need light at this particular point. So those you can start to store up now. See, this is a good time to get all these things together. You've got time. Now you have to buy potting. You have to buy potting mix. Um, you can buy mixes that have specific names, seed mix or seed blend or whatever. It doesn't much matter. You can use houseplant mix. It's the same thing. There's no difference. They're just labels. They, seed I've, I've actually seen a seed company. I visited a seed company in, uh, a soil company in uh, Riviere du and watched them change uh, the bag and put the same product in it. <laughs> it was the same thing. The machine kept rolling on, a new, new label came on. Hey, it's the same thing. So they're, they're good. One thing I would recommend, if possible, is to get fresh soil for seeds in the spring. If you're doing, it doesn't have to be open for only a week or so, but if you have soil from last year, that's perfectly fine for house plants, for container gardens, but diseases can tend to build up, or spores can tend to get into soil. So it's not a bad idea to have a, a fresh one open in the spring for your seeds, just, you know, just to sort of avoid some of those issues. And you can, the little, the little um, circle mycorrhizae, which are fungus, beneficial fungus, I'll talk about them in a minute. It is interesting to use ones that contain already these, these fungus. They help your plants grow better. We'll talk more about it, but I like the mix. I don't have to, that way I don't have to mix it separately. It's already there. So, uh, and I buy these huge, big blocks of, of soil. You know, that's 60 pounds of soil, that's a lot. But I need it, I, I do an awful lot of stuff with, with soil. Optional materials, fluorescent light. Um, this is especially gonna be useful when you're getting pretty serious about growing seeds. You don't need to start with this, but you might wanna think about it at some point in time. It, it gives you more space to garden under for one. It gives you excellent control over of light quality and duration, which you do not get in our climate if you're growing things by a window. So that's very, very handy. But um, it's an extra expense, of course, so you have to think about that. But if you're growing a lot of seeds, they're pretty good. What I would recommend if you're getting fluorescent lights is to get what is called a shop light. It's basically a light that can be hung from a structure, from the ceiling, from some piece of furniture, because you can adjust the height. So it's very handy. Also, it has a reflector included, so it directs the light towards the bottom. So that's also uh, very practical. And they're not expensive. They're about the least expensive lights you can get in fluorescent lamps because they're used so widely. The price is very, very low. When you're looking for fluorescent lights, look for ones with two tubes in them. 
it gives you more space to garden in because one single lamp doesn't light that much wide. When you join two, it more than doubles the light. So it gives you more a wider space to grow in. And also for economic reasons, if you can, if you have a safe sport, get the 1.2 meter ones, the four foot ones. Why? Because they're cheaper. They're the standard size. Those are the length, the length you see for office buildings and for workshops. Because of, uh, because of that, they're very inexpensive. The replacement parts are inexpensive. If you buy a, a, a two foot one, it'll cost you more, it'll cost you more every time you buy anything for it. Four feet is just the length. So that saves money. When you're choosing tubes for these lamps, because they don't usually come with tubes, look for cool white, uh, which is interesting because they're the cheapest lights on the market. And that's what you need for seeds. Now, of course, you'll see all these wonderful horticultural lamps, which are very expensive and they promise the best quality light and they're, they're just like sunlight, blah, blah, blah. But we're working with seedlings here. If we're, if we're gonna be growing, I don't know, cactus under lights or orcas under lights, you'd be looking at that sort of thing. But we're growing seedlings. And it turns out that seedlings have a preference for light. They like light that's more in the blue range. The idea of cool white is sort of a, a bluish white. And so these are more in the line with see, what seedlings need. It does not, they do not stimulate flowering, but you don't want your plants to flower indoors. You want them to flower outdoors. So they're very good for it. So they're cheap. And uh, what I often do is I wait till they're on sale at Canadian Tire, and then I buy a box of 24. And that keeps me going for a few years. And, or, or buy them in a group and divide them. You can get really good prices if you buy more than one or two at a time. Now to whatever fluorescent light you get, you're gonna to wanna to add a timer. They're cheap, really not expensive. And you can put an enormous number of fluorescent lights on a timer. They don't use much electricity. So I have an entire basement full on two timers, really, during the, the height of the season. Very inexpensive, maybe $15. And uh, set them for 14 to 16 hour days. And it's like telling your plant, it's spring, it's no longer winter, it's spring, time to grow. And they rank very well to it. You don't need these, but they're, they're very handy, especially if you get to the point where starting seeds really early in the season. Because it's one thing to start seeds when the days are longer, but this time of year, it's dark. And they, this kind of light is very handy. Now, the coming thing are the lead lights. They're They'll eventually be less expensive. They're still more expensive. They are less expensive to run. I saw an article about it five months ago. Some comments had done, had done the calculations. They're still more expensive than fluorescent lights, but not by much. Because it would take you apparently 35 years of running them to catch up what the fluorescent light would have cost you. It's not a huge difference. To, we're talking about dollars, but still a few dollars, but still. They're getting there. They will be cheaper one day. When you buy them, you have all different kinds, of course. And people tend to be attracted to the, the blue and red ones, which give you this sort of pinkish color, which I've recently learned has got a name now. It's called blurple. Blurple lights. I just thought it was so funny. And personally, I put the word annoying in. It is the most annoying color in the world. It's absolutely horrible. And uh, it doesn't really do anything special for plants. It just looks good because you think it's got a red light and blue light and plants like red and blue, that should be good. But the pro and they do, plants grow perfectly well under them. That's not the problem. But look at what they look like. You can't see what you're doing. <laughs> you don't know if your plant's alive or dead. It looks brown. Uh, I, I, I visited one man who had these and he was showing me very proudly all his plants. He'd pull them out and put them in natural light so you could see them, then put them back into the lab because you didn't know what was going on. I just find them absolutely awful. And you can get pure white, it's fine. You know, plants, seedlings are not that difficult when it comes to light quality. They really aren't. And white is easier on our eyes. We see the well, and if there's anything going on, like an insect or whatever, you'd see it faster. <laughs> You would never see an insect under blurple light. You'd have no idea what was going on. 
Now here are those mycorrhizae. So we'll talk about those now. These are these beneficial fungus, and they're all kinds of them. The ones in, you can you actually buy are, are kind of more limited, but still the idea with these fungus is that they grow into your plants. They're actually joined to it and they grow out from it and they have what we call hyphae. Hyphae are like roots, but they're fungus. And they actually go out in the soil and they pull in moisture and they pull in minerals and they feed the plants. So your plants grow better with, with them. Now there are exceptions, there are always exceptions to everything. But most plants, something like 95% of plants, will grow better with beneficial fungi with mycorrhizae. So it's worthwhile having them in the soil. Outdoors in the garden, they might already be there. It depends on your conditions. Because if they do, they're out in there in the wild, of course. But I like to add them to my soil when I plant to get the roots off to a good start. You know, better root growth at the beginning of the season. And you, as I said, you can buy soil with, with, where they're already there or you can add it. You can buy them separately and add them to your potting mix. Depends. And you'll just find your plants will do a little bit better. And there's even a theory that they help protect against certain soil diseases. It hasn't been proven, but I suspect it might be true. So I, I do try to use these. And heating pad, maybe, depends on your conditions. Um, I have one, just one. I don't use it on all my seeds because I wouldn't have space. But I use it on the ones that are a bit slower growing or that I know are a bit more difficult or need special heat. Uh, it's a very simple heating pad. I have no control of the temperature. I just plug it in, put the, the, the tray on top or the trays, and it gives a little bit of extra heat. And some that are, plants that are a bit slow to start, like, for example, always, I always start my parsley on it because parsley is not fast. It, it grows fine when it's, it's going, but it just takes forever to germinate. And this gives you a couple more days ahead because of the extra heat. And of course, if you're growing anything really ultra tropical, they'll, they'll like that as well. And if, and if you're growing in a spot that's on the cool side, you may find them almost necessary. It just depends on your growing conditions. They're not expensive, by the way. They're very inexpensive. You might have to buy them by um, internet. They're not in all the stores, but they're practical. Now, you've got your material. Now, before you start growing any kind of seeds, check to see what you see on the back of it. When to sow them, we, talk, we talked about that all already. You'll notice that they usually indicate how, de how deep to plant them. This one says one quarter inch. Um, so it could be in American measurements, it could be in, in, in centimeters, depends on the company. Um, how far to space them. This one doesn't say how far, how to spot, far the space the seeds. It says how to, how to thin them. It gives you an idea of what spacing you're gonna need in the garden. Um, and if there's any kind of special need, and this one doesn't really have any, it'll, it'll tell you as well. So this kind of information is very valuable. And I just, I, I trust my seed backs. I just, I just go with whatever they say. I, for, I turn my own brain off and say, it says do that, I'll do that. It just makes it easier on me. So yeah, it's a very good place to check. And if you can't find it there, well, you can always go to other sources to find the information. Now, so one of the things they might mention are special needs. The one I just showed you didn't have any. They might say, don't cover the seeds or a term similar to that. When you see that, what's going on is that we're talking about very fine seeds. Some of these are like powder. I don't know if anyone here has tried begonias. It's like dust. They're, you can't believe anything could possibly grow from something so small. And pretty logically, the, the, all the ones that you, you don't cover are always very fine, very tiny little things. And they're hard to apply. If you, you can't really put them one by one like you could with other seeds. They're just too dust-like. What I simply do is take a piece of white paper. Why white? Because I can see my seeds. I can see what I'm doing. I mean, we're talking about dust here, nearly. So, you know, white, those little tiny darker spots, you can see what you do. Fold it in half to make sort of like a funnel sort of, and you hold it over your page, pour the seeds in to fold, tilt the seed and just gently tap. And they'll sort of fall forward one by a time. And that will give you pretty good control. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good control for, for applying it. Now you can actually find seed dispensers. They never seem to work very well, but they're there. I, I just 
piece of paper is fine. Works very well for me. And it'll give you control. And furthermore, when you do finish, when you've got them placed, um, you can just lightly press with a piece of wood or with, I've always promised myself I'd make something like this. And I, I've never gotten around to it. It's just to pick a piece of wood from something and use it. Just press them down. I just want to make sure those little tiny seeds are actually in contact with the soil, and not really lying on top of it. And then you would spray with lukewarm water. So you would get that, that little spray bottle that you, I'm sure you have. You can take an old Windex bottle and rinse it and use it. Not a problem. And uh, just spritz it just to make sure they're in contact with moisture and settle down. And that gets your, your seeds off to its very first start. Now you might see need light, needs light for germination. Yeah, yeah, I would say that about maybe about a third of the seeds that we sow need light to germinate. If you put them in the dark, they won't sprout. They need light to germinate. And those others don't care. So personally, I put all my seeds in light when I'm sprouting them. Unless I see one that says needs darkness for germination, that's much rarer. But there are a few. But if you need light for germination, these are ones you're not going to cover again. You do exactly what we said, just press lightning spray. And then you put them under a light. Could be a fluorescent light or a lead light, or it could be on a windowsill or somewhere near a window. Um, you're looking for, in that case, good light. It's, it's light you can see there. You ought to be able to read a newspaper there without turning a light on in, in the middle of the day. Of course, this time of year, if it's cloudy, that's you have to wait for a sunny, those rare sunny minutes and check that one out. But uh, that, that'd be a good spot. You don't want to keep your plants in full sun yet because I think you can imagine that inside a closed container exposed to the sun, if we get more than 15 minutes of sun per day, it could get hot in there, really hot. And you don't want them to boil or cook. So bright light, no full sun yet. Full sun that'll come later, but that's where you special things. You need light for germination. So I just put all my seeds there unless I see something else. Needs cold treatment. It might be called stratification, which is an old term, which I don't recommend because it people used to think they had to be layered with soil. And that was what a stratification meant. But it's now we know when it's, it's, it's cold that they need. So I think cold treatment says it better. And these are seeds that need a, a, temper, a period of cold temperatures before they will germinate. Like it could be as little as two weeks, it could be up to three months. And it tends to be not so much vegetables, very few vegetables, not many annuals either, but a lot of cold climate plants, uh, that long lived plants, perennials, trees and shrubs. I would say most of them need a cold treatment. In general, if you're growing perennials, you need to know this. They will not germinate or they won't germinate well if you just expose them to heat. They need cold. It doesn't make sense. So why? Why would a plant want cold? Isn't sun and, and warmth what makes them grow? Yes, but these cold climate plants adopt, adapted to a cold climate. They've had to live for millions of years in cold. And so they're protected from germinating too early. The seeds fall on the drop to the ground in the fall. If they germinated right away, well, then it would start to sprout and winter would kill them. So nature has planned it so that when they fall to the ground, they will not germinate unless they have cold weather for a varying length of time. And for a lot of seeds from our area, it'll be three months. Without three months of winter, they won't germinate. You that And by the way, those are minimums. You could take a two week plant and leave it for three months, as long as you keep it cold. It, 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 needs, it needs those two, two weeks at least. You could leave them for, for six months. They need at least the two weeks or three months or whatever that particular variety needs. And what happens is that when they're exposed to cold and moisture, to the final point, the two together, it, there are little products that inhibit growth and they start to break down. And when it's gone, they'll be ready to sprout. So you need moisture and not soaking wet, just a bit of moisture. 
like as if they're outdoors on the ground. That's your, you're repeating what Mother Nature would do, really, for doing it indoors. So I keep people, hear people say, well, I'll just put my seed pack in the fridge and then I'll plant it after two months. It's dry, it won't work. It has to be moist. And then after two weeks, it'll work. So what I do is, and you could, there's various things you could try. I put my little pots of seeds and I chose a delphinium because it's one of the plants that needs cold. I just seal it in a, in a little plastic bag and stuff it in the fridge. And then my wife and I fight over how many seeds I'm allowed to put in the fridge. But we all, she, she bought a, a wine cooler. So I've, I've taken that over pretty much. So we're, we're getting along better, but she claims the wine isn't the right temperature. Really. Who cares about that? It's the seeds that count, right? <laughs> I care nothing about the wine, <laughs> but I leave them there. My fridge fills up. I also, by the way, can, you can, you can any, any cold spot would work. I have, actually have a cold frame where it doesn't get all that cold in the winter. Maybe every now, it can freeze every now and then, by the way, as long as it doesn't stay frozen all winter long. And I put a lot, I put a lot of my seeds in my cold frame and they'll get their cold weather there. Um, so swallow the seeds in damp potting mix, seal them in a plastic bag. We're gonna seal them because we don't want them to dry out while they're there, right? When they're in the fridge, I never check them, I just leave them there. I'm not gonna sprout, it's too cold. So you don't have to come back and add water. So seal them inside something. Um, I often sow these plants in January. It's a very good time. You're gonna get your three months easily. And so uh, I haven't started yet, but I'm getting close to starting to sow some of my, my perennials uh, indoors at this time of year. And that way, by the time March comes around, you can pull them out and put them in the heat and off they go. And I'll trim it after that. And so you can put them in a cold frame. If, if you have a, a cold room, you can put them in there, they'd be perfect. Anywhere that's cold, or a garage that doesn't freeze or doesn't freeze very much, not the dead or good place you could put them. Somewhere they're just gonna be cold inside the little bags. Then you see seeds that say they need to be scarified or soaked. Um, it's the same situation, but just different solutions to the same situation. These are seeds that have a very hard seed shell. They're designed to take a long time to germinate. In nature, I don't know under what conditions, for some reason or another, they shouldn't germinate quickly. And so they're programmed to take months and months to start to grow. And that can be discouraging. So what you're gonna do is try to soften up the seed coat and that way they'll germinate more quickly. Now, my favorite method, it's the easiest method, is to soak them. And we're talking about things that lupins are like that. Um, big, often they're quite big seeds, very hard things. Cannas, canna seeds were actually used as shot in shotguns. They're that hard, <laughs> it's really quite amazing. But if you soak them after 24 hours in lukewarm water, I just take a thermos, pour in like, well, I pour it in, it's, it's not boiling, but pretty close, it's really hot. Leaving the thermos overnight at 24 hours. And when they absorb water, they, they float at first and they'll drop to the bottom. So you know that they're, they're ready. Sometimes only a few drop to the bottom after 24 hours. So I take the ones that didn't sink, I redo the test, and, I, and then usually then most will sink. Any that don't sink are not good. So you've just eliminated seeds that were not good and save space in your pots for the right ones. So soaking seeds for the, those really hard ones and it'll usually say something on the label again. The seed pack should tell you that these plants need special treatment to get to germinate. So one way is you could soak them. You could also clip off the tip. I do that with seeds that are big enough I can actually handle them readily. And I, I on books I use all sorts of tools. I just take nail clippers, paint on the nail clipper and just take a little corner off and let the, let, let, let the water in and they'll be able to germinate. So that's a, Easy enough to not, not, not a really, really hard ones. You'd never, that wouldn't work with a can of seed for sure. But with quite a few, you can just clip a corner off and that's fine. Or you can file them down. When I first learned about this, I'm talking about years ago, I actually got an, a file and sat there and filed away at seeds. 
that's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And then I learned you can put them in a bottle, put sandpaper inside with the sandy side towards the center and shake. Well, that's easy enough. So when my kids were home, we used to, we used to play, make maracas with them. And shake and shake and shake and shake. And we'd put on music and we'd dance around. And then I'd get my seeds. And I still think <laughs> to this very day, my kids are convinced you can only play maracas in the spring because that's the season when you do that sort of thing. I'm not sure they really got what I was going about, but it was handy. It was fun. We had a laugh with that. And uh, you know, have fun with it. Hey, bring your kids into it, your grandkids into it, growing from seeds. That is so pleasant. They're, they're really getting into it. Okay. Uh, wow, we're ready to go. Wow. You got your so seeds there. Larry, hi. Yeah. I'm just a Julie. I'm just going to interrupt. Uh, sure. Where are you at in your presentation? Are you about halfway through or a bit more than that? Or? I'm about halfway through. I think. About halfway through. Okay, so I just want to see, uh, I, I just take a look at, see if anybody has a question. So I'm just going to go through looking at everybody. Uh, if you have a, a pressing question, just put your hand up and if anybody and I can see you. Let's see if anybody is doing okay. And some people have their cameras off. So nobody's coming forward. Does anybody have a question they just want to interrupt? Just pop their microphone on. No, we're good. Um, Everybody's, oh, yes, somebody. I will ask a question. Hi. Um, Hi, Tepreen. How are you? Good, good. Nice to see uh, you. You too, you too. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm learning so much stuff. Um, I was wondering, do we, if we wanted to talk about something that you're presenting we would wait to the end like if we want to go a bit deeper in stratification and Look, if, you, um, if, if there's a way of interrupting i don't know how i could do that but if we're talking about stratification ideally you'd, you'd ask why i'm talking about stratification i don't know if you can do that or not yeah 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 so um you were you were saying that you it was mostly with the perennials and the shrubs and the trees seems to be yes. that you were needing to do stratification so was it was it that you were you were putting the seed in soil outside because you were talking about moist right? no. most of this this is all being done indoors and the idea being i'm starting them early to get ahead of the season and not to risk my plants outside with all the <clears throat> dangers that there can be and so but it just tends to be mostly in the group of perennials and and, and trees and shrubs you've got a few like rice and which is one that would be an annual that we do this to lupins and try to work of others, but uh, cannas. But uh, yeah, it's um, it can be handy for certain plants. And normally the label will tell you or recommend it, or if not, you'll find it on the internet or in a book. So it's when you when you were talking about a cold, um, moist space, it's putting them outside will create the moisture inside the bag but it's just leaving the seeds in there or is there adding something wet into the actual space there's there's so, there's moist soil you would plant them moist soil. Okay. You yeah plant the seeds, okay put them in a bag seal it put it coal in the cold afterward that may not have been clear sorry about that yes you'd you'd actually literally be plant as if as if you were planting them for to grow tomorrow but instead of putting them in the sun you put them in the cold and then you wait and, and so like just putting a bunch of seeds in a jar and sticking it outside, the experience of the perennial or the, the seed that falls, like milkweed, for example, if you grab a bunch of that and then stick it in a jar and leave it outside, you're not actually doing the process. No, because you have to have contact with moist soil. You could do that. Okay. They will sprout in the spring. You can put them in the ground and they'll sprout in the right. spring. The difference being okay. if you sow seeds outdoors uh, in the ground, over winter, there's going to be insects eating some of them, birds will get others, and you know, you won't get as much germination. You've more you have more control indoors. You've eliminated their enemies and you've given them better conditions. But yeah. Thank that help? you. Okay. Oh, I have so many questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna call you actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well let's we'll, we'll have some more time at the end. I, thank you, Tipreen. That's that is a good question. Uh, anybody else uh, with a pressing question? I can sort of looking through. Just uh, anybody want to jump in? Um, no, I don't hear anybody so far. I I have one little question, uh, Larry, about very small dusty seeds because this has been my problem. I have tried to press them in with my fingers. They stick to my fingers, and I take them up. 
is the by pressing them in with the wood, do, do they not stick to the wood? Is that why you use a piece of wood? I, I, I don't use, I use wood, it seems to work well. I don't use plastic. There seems to be an electric charge to plastic and it sticks to it. And by the way, I never keep um, really fine season plastic bags because I have a hard time getting them out. Uh, glass is better or, or maybe hard plastics, but not, not soft ones. Yeah, uh, I don't have a total explanation of that, but uh, it works fine. Okay, great. So uh, if anybody else has a, a question, just to keep, write it down and uh, we'll, we'll continue. Thank you, Larry. It's, it's very interesting and it's very clear, uh, your presentation so far. So uh, save your questions, folks, and we'll have a little discussion after. Thanks, Larry. Okay. Well, okay, this is the totally different stuff. This is, you'll be doing, if you're sowing from seed, you'll be doing this several times probably in the spring because we're starting different plants at different times. So you'd have your setup. I have a, I have a basement uh, planting table. That's why I do that. I no longer use the kitchen table. It's just a very good idea. It's one of the reasons that my wife and I are still married to this day. <laughs> because those of you garden and you're using the kitchen table, you get the conflict between the gardener who says, well, dirt isn't, soil isn't dirt. And the other person is totally convinced of the contrary. And you can't, you're not going to clean your table off just because you're having lunch. You just push it to one side. No, it doesn't work. So you, you do need a potting space somewhere. It's very handy. So you've got it, you've got the soil. You've bought potting soil. We'll talk about that in a second too. And you maybe bought mycorrhizae or it's got mycorrhizae in it. You can mix them together. And I just use a bucket or bowl, whatever, uh, recycle for something else. I don't have a special container for that. And add lukewarm water. Why lukewarm water? Because we're gonna be putting these, most of them will be going into warm conditions anyway. And even the ones that will be getting cold, well, it, water is better absorbed when it's warm than when it's cold. And you want it just to be slightly moist. So you pour it in, mix it up. I always use one of those wooden cooking spoons. That's my tool for mixing soil. And uh, you try to get it to a sort of texture of a run out sponge. So just a bit moist. And that's perfect. If you had too much water, okay, we've all done that. Add more soil, <laughs> it'll absorb, mix it again. You want to get, to, you don't want them to be soaking. You want them to be moist, but not wet. And it's much easier to work with, by the way. Dry soil is very dusty, it gets up your nose and get it moist, it'll stay put. So it's very handy to have it moist. Now you start putting your potting soil into the container, whatever it is. Again, kitchen, grab stuff from the kitchen. I use a tablespoon or a teaspoon, depending what I'm working with. I have no really indoor gardening tools for that. It's, it's I have stuff in the kitchen. Um, you sort of smooth it over, even it out. Leave a little bit of space for watering later on. If it's totally full and you try to water, everything's gonna overflow. So you've got to have a little bit of space at the top where the water can sink in. Now, if you're using individual containers, like it could be a pot, individual pot, it could be cell packs like we see here. Um, Usually you're putting two to three seeds per pot. And that's just in case germination isn't good because it's very annoying when you've got one seed per pot and you've got 10 pots and only three germinate. That's annoying. If you've got a, 10 pots with three each, pretty much everyone will have at least one plant coming up, maybe two. Maybe you could get it with two. I always do three. But then of course, my father taught me this little, this little rhyme when I was a kid. Three seeds in a row, one for the snow, one for the crow, and one to grow. And so I always remember three. And the idea being things can go wrong, but one of them will survive. So I go for three. You know, I stick with it. Although seed germination is better these days. We've got much better conditions to grow them under, but still, I still do that. So here we go, step by step. Once again, using kitchen stuff, spoons or whatever pencils, things like that. Make a hole in the center of the pot. Look for the recommended depth for sowing. It'll probably be on the label, the seed pack. If it's not, look it up. And if you don't know, and of course, sometimes you don't, you might have harvested this seed some, from somewhere. Well, try three times the height of the seed, whatever it is, about three times that. And if it's not exactly right, it's no big deal. Just don't plant too deep. Some seeds will not push their way up very far. So, uh, and of course the very fine ones where you don't, you put the right on the surface. They're the exception to the rule. 
So in the, the hole goes in, whoops, and you drop three seeds in, one after the other. Um, I try not to actually handle them. Always fearful that I might put some wax or oil on them. You know, sort of, I often use my paper method to get them into place as well. And you can, you can buy seed uh, dispersers if you want to. But try to get your three in to the bottom or close to the bottom. I use a pencil to push them sometimes. I have a pencil with me at all times when I'm doing this. And you cover them with mix, just lightly cover them. No need to, to push, just make sure they're covered in soil for the ones that are not on the surface. Just cover them. Then you get your spray bottle out, warm water, and just spray lightly. That'll push the cell down just a touch. It'll make sure they're in contact with moisture. And you've got it done. You're pretty much done. That's the, the most important where your seeds are now planted. So after that, your label. Always label your plants. You have no idea how two plants can look alike when you knew for sure that that was the red tomato and that was the green one. And then all of us, and you, the green one's on the right throat. You do not know anymore. And it's, no, do, make, I make my labels first, actually. When I get my seeds laid out, the label gets made up and I can just stick them in the pot as they, as they go along. But you need these labels. The, I'm not gonna go all the details of the things that can go wrong with labels, but they can race, they can break, people can take them. Squirrels and chipmunks seem to love them and they run off with them, <laughs> but you do your best. And they, I, I actually have a, I don't think I have one with me, I could have shown you that. Indelible ultraviolet light proof pen that probably won't erase for at least a year. So that means I don't lose what I've written on it. I always write the name of the plant and maybe it's just me, but I like to write the date. So I can remember when I grew it. Cause some years you'll say, well, that was, I was right on this with you. That was just perfect. Or another time I say, well, that went, no, that was a bit too early. Or maybe I could have done it later. So I have the, the date written on it. And so I remember what I'm doing. Oh, by the way, you can use just about anything for labels. You, know, you can buy them, you can make them, coffee stirrers. If you go to, if you, I'm not a coffee shop person, but you can come up with all sorts of stuff from a coffee shop you can use in doing seeds. Like really fill up on their stuff. Walk away with pockets full, I don't know. Very handy. So you've got your plants are planted and we're now gonna cover them with something to give them high humidity. This is where this plastic bag or dome comes in. I use both things. I use domes, I use plastic bags. I save up plastic bags. If you can't see from here, if I turn my screen around, you'd see that I've got a desk on the other side. And at the moment, it's got about this high full of plastic bags that I've been collecting. So I'm sorting through them, deciding which ones need to be washed for using and whatnot. But uh, I'm getting into my seed. It's, it's the season's coming, so yeah, the bags are out and they're getting ready. Um, so we'd cover the plastic bag. That'll keep the humidity in, and then you put them in a warm spot. Now this is average temperatures for germination, 21 to 24 degrees centigrade. You might find very few, but seeds that like it colder. That does happen, not often, but it, it can. If so, the label. Hopefully the seed pack will say so, and you'll put it in a cooler spot. And you get some of the, some like it warmer than that. You know, like more, more of the 24 than the 21, so the degrees Celsius, and you would put them there. Some more they're getting like, as mentioned, bright light, no sun, but it could be under, under a lamp. And this is where the heating lamp can, can be useful. This is where you need it. It's only gonna be used to start them. The, seeding, the heating lamp is not for growing seeds, it's for germinating seeds. So it's while they're going to this period where they need this extra warmth, this extra humidity. And it's interesting to realize this works for pretty much every plant, even cactus. You say, cactus, come on, they grow in a desert. They can't possibly want humidity and warmth to germinate, and yet they do. In a desert, cactus will not sprout unless they've had 
extreme rain for days at a time, and the ground is soaking wet. Then it'll germinate and start to grow. And if it stays wet long enough or moist long enough, they'll germinate and start to grow. And then they'll slow down. But they need that humidity to get going. So you can grow ferns, you can grow cactus. They all need this kind of condition. Um, no direct sun. This is where it's going to heat up. If you don't know what the, where the greenhouse effect is, put a bag of seedlings in a sunny window and you'll discover what that is. The bag will fill it with humidity and it'll turn really hot. So no direct sun at this point. And then germination occurs. When? Well, you never know. The label might tell you, they might give an idea. So you could, oh, it's interesting because if it says it germinates in three weeks and you're two months along, probably something has gone wrong. <laughs> you can maybe abandon that particular plant, but it'll usually say, and sometimes it's so fast, you say, I just sowed that, it can't possibly be germinating. And there it goes. Other times it takes, I would say about two weeks. I would expect most of my stuff to be starting to show life, but some are slower and then you get the really slow ones. The very worst, I once decided I wanted to fill my garden with trillions. And uh, I was in Ontario where they have lots of the white ones. There are no white ones in the big city, but just the red ones here. And so I went and, and I collected all over the place these, these seeds. They took three years to germinate, three years. And I've got thousands of white trilliums now, but <laughs> I thought I'd lost them. I, I could know. I think the first year, maybe two germinated, and maybe a hundred the next year. And then after that, they were everywhere. <laughs> but you, you never know. Seeds are weird sometimes. And, but trilliums, I found out later, have a reputation of being really slow. It wasn't just me. Everyone has the same problem with them. Anyway, when you see them growing, of course, this, then it becomes really exciting because they change every single day from this point on. It's like twice a day, three. You know, you keep checking on them, looking at them, watching them grow, taking the plastic off like too tall, whatever. You know, you've got to keep your eyes on them. So this is this is fun, and they all do it at different speeds. One of the reasons I like to have, um, I don't like to mingle different seeds in the same tray, in, in the same soil, the same tray, because they don't grow at the same speed. And that throws me off. I like to be able to move them around. I'll put all the ones about the same height together. That way you can put them the same distance from the light. See that in a minute. But uh, so here we go. The fun part is begun. They're growing. And of course, right, I, I put a bean seed. There are lots, good, a good plant for kids. It's really fast, it's impressive. And they'll like that, they really like that. Little tiny things, they, they don't get that. Big and fast, they get that, they'll have fun. Now, once they germinate, you don't need the heat anymore. And you don't need the humidity anymore. Too humid could be a risk of disease. You don't want that. So you've got to try and get more air to them. So the time has come to remove the covering, which you should not do just like that, especially if the little tiniest seeds are the most fragile ones. So you would try to be delicate. So what I do is I simply start, if it's in a plastic bag, I'll open a little bit. The next day, I'll open a bit more, then a bit more until they're exposed over a couple of days. If I got a, a, a tray like here, I'll lift up a corner one day, lift another corner the next day, turn it on an angle the next day. So more air gets in and the humidity gets out and then take it off. This is also, when you've got that off, you don't have to worry about them anymore getting too hot under the tray. And now you can move in the sun. All that you can get them. If you're going on a windowsill, sun, 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 and more sun. Indoors, it's not like outdoors. Um, the sun isn't as, ever as intense as it would be outdoors. So uh, you can put them right in the brightest light you have. The heat's no longer a problem because the dome isn't there and there'll be air circulation. Now, here we have a bit of a conflict because they love plenty of sun and they want lower temperatures, which is like, that doesn't work. So I must admit, I do not have a lot of temperature control. My house was designed for people, not for plants. And so on my windowsills, I don't get much control. My, that's one of the reasons I grow a lot of under lights in the basement where I can keep it a bit cooler. Because if you keep it cooler, 
most, especially at night, during the daytime, not a problem. But if your temperature drops at night, <coughs> excuse me, it gives you more compact plants. Rather than going up and getting kind of stringy looking, they tend to be compact and dense. And so if I can get down to 15 degrees at night, that's a bit cool for the average house. But I can, I can get close to that in my basement at any rate. And that just gives me a little bit better quality plant. It's not the end of the world. In fact, if your plants look a little bit too stringy or too long, once they're in the garden, they recuperate pretty much. But it's just, it's kind of nice when, when you look and say, yeah, if I, I would have paid $5 for that. And I only spent 15 cents. So it's, it's a sort of pleasure coming from that one. So anyway, cool and sunny after germination. There are exceptions to any rule I'm giving you here, but this is gonna work for most plants. Okay, once the dome comes off, you've got two things happening. There's gonna be more evaporation because there's no dome keeping humidity in, and the plants are growing and using water. So up until then, you, I mean, once, you're, once you've got plants sealed in a plastic, seed seed in that plastic bag, you basically are not gonna be watering them. They're gonna be, they'll stay moist. But once they're in the open, they're going to be watering. In tiny pots, you can see by color. <coughs> they start to get pale brown, so it changes color. So you've got a pretty good idea. Or if not, try lifting the tray. You can feel the difference. They're lighter and they're dry. And you do not want them to dry out. That's not a good thing. You want the start to dry out, but not to dry out completely. So then you have to water, start watering them. And I'll talk about watering in a second, but it's the time when they're growing, you have to do it. And fertilizer I hadn't mentioned before, partly because usually when you buy um, see, uh, any kind of potting soil, there's already fertilizer in it for a while. So you're no heat, need to fertilize. Besides, most seeds, except the very tiniest ones, have some sort of natural fertilizer in them already. So they're taking care of themselves at first. But when they have four true leaves, so we have the two coral leaves, the first two leaves, and then the other leaves that come in look different. And if four of them, maybe six of them, they're getting to the point where they've probably used up whatever fertilizer was already in the seed and they're going, getting through the soil, the fertilizer already in the soil. And I would recommend a quarter of the recommended rate, some sort of liquid fertilizer. By the way, it doesn't matter which one, eh? Plants can't read seed label, uh, fertilizer labels, they don't, they don't care. You can give a, an orchid fertilizer to a seed or a lawn fertilizer, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's just minerals they need. And you could apply, I actually mostly use for seeds, um, liquid algae or, or something like that. But whatever you have, it doesn't really much matter. But you give it a little bit. I have a question about the fertilizer. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, can I ask a question? Okay. Um, does it matter, like for the fertilizer, you say a liquid fertilizer, if it's uh, pelleted, fertilizer, can you just dilute that in water and uh, oh, no. give that to the plants? No, those, those are the more something I would use for plants I'm planting out. Um, now, I wouldn't okay. use seedlings. They're concentrated, by the way. Now, they're hard. They're, they, they don't dilute very well. A lot of the pelican ones oh, okay. are designed to release, slow release, and so they wouldn't really melt in water. Now, try to find a liquid or soluble fertilizer for seedlings. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, You've got your seeds maybe under lights. If so, try to keep them about 10 to 15 centimeters above. So you can raise your lamp if it's on chains or whatever, or you can raise the container, drop or lower the container. I, I use a lot of inverted pots. I have so many pots, I can do all sorts of things with them. And uh, so I will, I'll start off with my seeds right up near the lamp on upside down pots. And as they grow, I take pots out and bring them down. So there are different ways of keeping them in about that zone. So the top leaves you're trying to get quite near the lamp where they get more light. Watering. I mentioned it's important. You cannot let them dry. You don't want to let them dry out, but you don't want them to be soaking water either. Now, if you're using a watering can to water, uh, these seedlings are a bit advanced. They're going to stand up pretty well, but they're very young ones. You've got to be very careful. You can knock them flat if the water comes out too fast. So just be very careful when you're watering. Uh, you don't want to do that. 
and especially the littlest, tiniest ones. Uh, I usually don't do this. What I usually do is that. I soak. I pour water in the bottom. Not a lot. You don't need a lot. They're small pots. And I let them soak. And then after 15, 30 minutes, drain it away. Now you can take them out and pour, but I, we never eat turkey at the time I'm growing seeds. So I just take over the turkey baster for a couple of months each year. And my wife is none the wiser. She does no, has no idea. She doesn't have any idea what I'm doing. She, has, she never goes into my potting zone. She doesn't want to see it, I think. But it's just there. And I just pour out the extra water, which couldn't be easier. And uh, it really works very well. And because the soil changes color, you know the water is made at the top. It goes dark brown. So they are, you've watered. I find that very easy. But everyone's got their own methods. Whatever works for you. Yeah? It's not, not a problem. Oops, went in the wrong direction. Then you have to thin. This one is tough on people. They do not like it. When you're a beginner, it's like, what? What? I put all these efforts in and you're saying, thin out the plants? Now, what I do to encourage people is, if it's edible plants, you can eat the trimmings. This is your first harvest. So don't count as being, you're eliminating plants. It's your, you're producing sprouts to nibble on. And that solves the solution. It doesn't work for non-edible plants. And you'll actually, you'll find that in vegetables, about the only plants you would not be eating, able to eat, would be plants in the Solanaceae family. You wouldn't definitely not eat potatoes. You wouldn't want to eat um, ground cherries. They're poisonous. Tomatoes, without being poisonous, are not really very good. Uh, peppers either. But anything else, you can eat seedlings, all your other vegetables, all of them. So you're not, you're, you're thinning, yes, but you're, you're also producing. So that's a way of looking at it. Okay, the problem is, of course, you planted three seedlings in that pot, seeds in that pot, and three of them came up. That's too many. So you have to snip off the excess plants. I always do it when they start to touch. When they're, when they're starting to compete with each other, you don't want to slow them down. So snip, snip. Usually keep the strongest one, unless you have any other information. And there are a couple of weird plants where the weak ones turn out to be the best plants. But that would be on the label. It's not going to, you'll probably take years to get through one of those things, but you just get strange situations sometimes. And do not pull them out. If you try pulling out seedlings, you'll discover those little tiny roots are mixed with the little right tiny roots ne right next to them. And there all your plants come out. So which is not a good thing. So just cut them off at the base. And there you go, and nibble away. Or transplant. Now, this is where a lot of beginners have complications because they can't bear to throw the seedlings out. So thinning, they don't want to thin. And so they try to plant them all and they transplant. And then they find themselves with 175 tomato plants and situations which are absolutely untenable. You have to learn at some point in your gardening experience that there's a limit to how many plants you can grow, okay? And you have to try and figure it out. There's no use planting more than you need. I always plant a few extras. The problem is when you plant a few extras is you finally end up, plant, end up planting them and you're too crowded. Because I must admit, even myself, I have a hard time throwing them away when they're, they, they've gotten quite mature. I keep saying I should give it to my neighbors, but they kill everything. So that wouldn't be very nice. But, uh, but if you're sure, you're sure you're gonna need these plants, then do save them, it's not a problem, and transplant them into another container. Um, and again, when the seedlings start to touch. And I would just transplant them into a, a container big enough for one plant. But I, I rarely do this anymore. It, this was more a beginner thing that I did when I wasn't quite used to thinning. I no longer bother. It's too much work. All those little plants moving around, oh, forget it. I've got other things to do. So how to do it? This is so simple, but I'm gonna explain it anyway. You know, I think if I gave anybody a seedling with roots, a pot and soil, you'd all get it right. I mean, you're not gonna plant it upside down, right? 
you'd put the roots down, wouldn't you? I mean, it's, it couldn't be simpler, but still. So put a moist potting mix in the, in the container, leaving a bit of space at the top. No, we'll be watering later on. So you want some space. Dig a hole, use whatever you want to use. Pencil for small ones, spoon for bigger ones. You choose. Then you, you, you never grab a seed by its stem. Never touch the stem. Because if you squeeze just a bit too much, you've killed it. That stem is not replaced. But if you tear a leaf or break a leaf or squish a leaf, it's just one leaf. There are others and there'll be more. So if you break a leaf, it's not a problem. So I always take one leaf in my hand and I use something as a bit of a lever. I dig in and push up and lift at the same time. And then I've got my little plant and I can move it. So it's, it's, it's very easy to do. And then you drop the root ball into the hole. Most seedlings, 90% are going to the same depth. You don't want to put them in too deeply. A lot of plants will not do well. They like their crown on the top of the soil. Strawberries, by the way, if you're growing strawberries, now is the time, eh? You have to drop that symptom really, really early, and you will need light. You will need light for strawberries. They're not going to do well if they don't get light at this time of year. Um, but they have to be right on the top. If you put it too deeply, it's, it's a dead strawberry plant. There are a couple you can plant a bit more deeply. Anything that could root on its stem. All the salina seeds, all the, the um, that is, tomatoes, whatever, uh, peppers, you could plant deep, a bit more deeply, it wouldn't hurt. You could also do any of the cucurbits, which are the cucumbers and melons. They, they will also root, but anything else, same depth as they originally were. Fill them with moist potting soil, down, down gently but firmly. It's like really obvious, nothing complicated there. Then you water well. Now you can water from above by now. They, by the time you're doing this, they've probably grown a bit. They've got stronger stems, there's many leaves. They'll, they'll, be, they'll, they'll be able to take water from above if you want to at this point. You can still soak them, by the way, but I switch over. It's a bit faster this way. Possible problem, damping off. Interesting word, isn't it? Damping off. I don't know. What, it's been around for a while, I guess. That it's the most horrible thing. Your seedlings are growing. They look so happy and you're just thrilled to death. And then you come downstairs at five in the morning to look at your seedlings and they're flat on their back. Oh, first time it happened to me, I was maybe 12 years old, my first experience with seeds. I was devastated, absolutely devastated. Oh, it's horrifying. It's not one disease, it's a bunch of diseases. There's a whole bunch of them that can do this. There's spores that travel through the air. And that's why I try to use fresh seeds so at the beginning. I don't want to have any more than a half of spores in the soil when I, when I grow things. And what happens is it's as if something pinched the plant at the base. It's like brown. It's a disease. It does it. It's, they turn brown or black at the base and they fall over on the side. And you cannot save them. They are dying. They'll be green at the moment, but they'll be dead in two days. It's over. You can we'll talk about a treatment in a second. You can stop it. Let's say some of the seeds are affected and others aren't. And it'll all be like in one side of the of a container, or like it starts in one corner and moves across. <laughs> so you can maybe stop the other side. But once, it, once the plants are hit, you can't do anything about it. And it always happens overnight. You don't know why it comes out at night, but all of a sudden, morning comes and they're, they're down. Now, the good news, this is no longer the disease that was as pervasive as it used to be. It used to be a huge problem. And what's happened is that we've changed potting soils since when I was a kid. We used to use garden soil for seeds. You went in the garden, you dug up soil and you brought it in. It was full of diseases. You know, yeah, you're gonna have problems. Nobody does that anymore. And why would you? You don't want that to happen. So, um, and th these, these modern potting soils, they're, they're not sterile. Anyone tells you soil is sterile, sterile is, never, soil is never sterile. You don't want to be sterile. You need microbes. Microbes are good, but you've got 
well, most microbes are good, some aren't. So what you want is one that's got mostly good microbes and no, not the bad ones. So there is gonna be, there will be microbes in the soil. And once you open a bag of soil and add water, more will move in. You can't stop it, it's gonna happen. It's just not natural. But if you avoid soil from the garden, you can usually get away with it. I must admit, as a kid, when we were using outdoor soil, it was a problem every single year, every single year, no exceptions. And we used to have a product called no damp, or and it was a product you can't buy anymore. It wouldn't be acceptable these days, it's not organic. But we had this bottle of no damp, everything got treated to try and save the plants. Now, I don't even get a case every year. It's that it's it's that rare. And then every now and then, just to tell me that it's not gone and forgotten, I'll get one tray and it'll happen again. And but it's no longer the huge problem. So if it happens, okay, it happens. But what can you do? Um, since we no longer are using chemical pesticides to control diseases, you can try chamomile tea. There's a little tiny recipe there, which you. you You'll be able to have a recording of this. You can go back and write it down. It's basically chamomile tea. tea. And of course, uh, you let it cool off, right? You don't water plants with boiling water. Never a good thing. And what it will do is it will help stop it. It will not save the plants again. It'll just protect the other ones nearby and might be able to stop the disease. What I do if I'm working with something really delicate, and that hasn't happened in a number of years, but I've had a couple of, in the past, special seeds I've ordered from abroad and needed special care. And they said, very susceptible to damping off. I will use milled sphagnum. Now, the funny thing about milled sphagnum, sphagnum moss, okay, it's a moss. And it's, I'd say about 80% of the world's uh, sphagnum moss comes from Eastern Quebec. So <laughs> it's, it's from here. And in, in books and, and, and on the websites, they talk about milled sphagnum as if you could actually buy the stuff in a garden center, but you can't, it's not available. You can get it online, so you have to make your own. I buy sphagnum moss, you can get any, it's all the garden centers sell it. You use it for orchids, for among other things, dry. And then I just sift it, or grind it, oh, those words wrong, and grind it in the coffee grinder. My wife doesn't know that, but she doesn't need to know either. But that's, it's, not, no, it's, it's just moss, right? It's not gonna hurt anybody. And I just grind it up in really, really fine. And I spread over the top of the seeds rather than the soil. And sphagnum moss is an antibacterial and antibiotic product in this, in this First World War. They used to use it for wounds on people's skin to protect them from disease. So uh, very interesting product native to. So uh, don't hesitate to use it if you've got something really special and just wanna make sure that nothing happens to it. But once again, you can't really find milled sphagnum in your average garden center. Okay, here we're getting near the end. We've been watering, we've been fertilizing, we've been giving them light. You can turn the trays so they all grow more or less straight. And uh, it's, well, and then it comes time to put them outside. This is a, a dangerous thing to do because they will burn if you just stick them right out in the sun. You can't do that. You've got to acclimate them or acclimatize them. And I try for about a week or so of getting them used to being outdoors under the conditions I can give it. And I do it as soon as the temperature warms up. Now I'm being vague here because what one plant finds warm is cold for another. For example, I could, eat, I could move out lettuce or, or kale really early in the season. They don't mind it cool but I wouldn't want to put my tomatoes out and certainly not eggplants or, or melons until it's warm. So you have to use your, your judgment as to when you move them out. And you have to prepare to bring them back in again if it gets cold. Uh, I, I just love the way we now know what's coming up in the weather. When I was a kid, we didn't really. And so you put things out and bang, frost two days later. It was very annoying. Now he sort of, I, I look ahead and I'll say, oh, well, wait a minute. It's gonna go down to five degrees in two days. Uh, they're not gonna go outside yet. So I'll wait a little longer. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but in my area at any rate, we're not getting warmer springs than we used to have. 
the springs are colder. Then it gets warm. But I have not been gaining anything from this global warning in, warming in the spring. I've been delaying my plantings. I, I just can't put them out. I used to plant out things, things out at, in late May. I'm now well into June. So I've lost two weeks. But I've gained most years I gained in the fall. So anyway, I have to acclimatize them. So when the temperature warms up, and you have to prepare them in. And climatizing basically means, I think I had a photo of that one. Oh, I didn't. OK, um, put them in the, in the shade first. Completely in the shade, under trees, under furniture, north side of the house, whatever. Um, they won't be getting a lot of direct light. They'll be getting indirect light, though. And they'll be moved by the wind. That'll help. When plants move in the wind, their, stem, their, strings, their stems get stronger. So that's a, it's a step in the right direction. They'll be getting cooler nights a bit. But if it gets like, Depending on the plant, I would I would bring in tomatoes at at 14 degrees. I would leave my lettuce out at at, at six. You've got to try and judge it. But um, so I do a lot of a lot of I do some indoor outdoor stuff uh, at this time of year, depending on the weather. And after about three two three days in the shade, two three days in partial shade. In my case, what I try to get is morning sun and afternoon shade. And then after two or three days there, I like to have them in full sun. If their plants will be going into full sun, I like to have them in full sun, but still in a pot. And then I'd be ready to plant it out. So we're talking about a little over a week, a week, a little more, and I'm ready to plant out if all goes well. And if that cold weather comes back, they'll, they go back in a bit more and come back out again. It's uh, it can be a struggle some years, but. There are years you think, I'll never get my tomatoes in, I'll never get them in. You do eventually, but you just begin to doubt. And so here you go, really the final step, because once they're planted out, we can't even talk about seedlings anymore. They're plants, right? You, you've gone into the, the next stage. So there's no longer any danger of frost for most plants. There's not many would want to get frosted. And ideally, you do this on a cloudy day. The plants will sun on a plant that's freshly planted is gonna be a stressing factor. So if you can, a cloudy day is best, or cover them with newspaper or light cloth. I often use floating row cover for, you know, just the first night at least. So the first day, first night, and so they can settle in, it keeps the humidity up a bit while they're, while they're rooting in. And for the next two weeks, especially, just watch the watering. I mean, they're gonna need watering maybe anyway, but when they're really freshly planted, they haven't rooted yet into the ground, and you want the roots to get out there and get into the ground. And just a special note on tomatoes here. Um, if the tomatoes are overgrown, and they can get they can get pretty stretched out sometimes if they've been in the house for a long time, you can pull a few of the leaves at the bottom off, turn it on its side, and bury that part. It will root, and it'll give a stronger plant as well. So uh, just a, a little special thing you do for tomatoes and who doesn't grow tomatoes. So there you go. You've sown seeds, it's not hard. And if you pay attention, you'll, you should have good results. So that basically it was what I was gonna present you. I did wanna point out I have a book on scoring from seeds. It's in French though. The Semis de Jardin Paresseux. And it just got republished. Um, it sold out last year, like, everything sold out in the gardening world, right? Just wiped off the map. And it, it was apparently, it's, the editor, editor's always nice to tell you things. Authors are the last to know anything, right? It's been on the market for two months and I didn't know it. But anyway, it's, it's out there now, you can get it. And, or go to my website. I have two actually, laidbackgardener.blog, jardinyparasud.com in French. And among other things, I mean, I do a blog, an article a day, right? It's a, a daily blog. So there's like over 2,000 articles you can read there. But among other things, I have seeds to sow on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. If you look it up, it's, what do I sow in January? There aren't many seeds in January, by the way. That's very early. But I'll, I have a, I'll have a page for that. What to sow in mid-March, what to sow in early April. So I've got all these dates with the things you should sow. 
it's based on the on the garden area that we live in. Basically, we're we're in the same zone, pretty much. So these are the right dates for you. So uh, it could be very handy that, to do. So that basically covers what I wanted to show you. And so I figured to click this off somehow. That would probably do it.